I'm Jonathan Dyson. I'm the Chief Fire Officer of North Yorkshire Fire and Rescue Service. And we're all familiar with the fire service. Yeah. But what, what does a Chief Fire Officer do? The Chief Fire Officer in any service is responsible for the strategic direction of the organisation. The Chief Fire Officer is solely responsible for the, the people within the organisation, the resources, i.e. its appliances and the fire engines, and also we're responsible for delivering the primacy of what we're here for, which is the public safety. And recently then, there's been some changes. There's been like a consultation that has yes. come through the, the Police Fire and Crime Commissioner. Yes. And I know that needs to go through a particular process, so it's gone through it comments from the public. Um, I think it's fair to say it's quite complex to understand the changes. I know I looked okay. at them and a little bit sort of struggled to really appreciate what they meant. Right. What, what do you think people need to know about those changes? Where are they now in terms of the process? Okay. The public consultation for us is a legal duty. So when any fire service wants to make any changes, they have to consult the public and their own workforce on those proposed changes. When we've consulted on those proposed changes, that gives the public the opportunity to have a say whether they accept or not. And if they offer recommendations for change in any other way, we have to take those into account. So the public consultation we, uh, or the commissioner undertook as the commissioner is the fire authority. She consulted on a number of changes which were around the service relating to duty systems, changes for instance to automatic fire alarm attendance, and then a reduction in the number of fire appliances that we have within the county. The consultation was concluded some time ago and we were set to deliver it and we are delivering through a three-phased approach. The first uh, uh, section is on to Huntington. The second is here in Harrogate, and the third is over in Scarborough. Now we've more or less completed the first phase, and we're moving on to the second phase of, of Harrogate. And when I talk around those in phases, it's because we have a legal duty and a moral duty to make sure that we engage with our crews and our staff first. So we undertake all of that consultation with our crews to make sure we're achieving what was the original plan, but we want to do it in the most people-centered way, and we want to hear their voices on how we implement that change. That's why we keep it quite high level when we're in the public, because of course it would be wrong for the public to hear changes before our own staff do, and for them not to have had a say in how that's delivered. But we've almost finished our consultation with the crews of Huntington, ready to be implemented, and then we'll move on to Harrogate in the very near future. And people tend to work in a very black and white kind of way, yes. don't they, with changes? They're either good or bad. Of course. Um, but nothing stands still, does it? And I think no, perhaps people don't understand how the role has changed with the fire service. They maybe don't understand the, you know, the, the volume of call outs or the preventative work that, that you yes, do. Yes. Okay. So what, how has that changed then over, over the last few years? Well, f for more than 20 years plus the fire service has been pushing the, the, the first point of alcohol is to the protection and prevention of, of risk and, and, and vulnerability. If we're responding with a fire engine, in theory, something's gone wrong or we are, you know, unfortunately there's been an accident or something else requiring a fire service intervention. We, of course, want to prevent or stop all of those wherever possible. So our crew's focus is on prevention and protection. We prevent risk within the community through engaging with um, communities, with schools, with individuals of all ages, because, of course, fire... Whilst we say fire doesn't discriminate in who it affects, it does discriminate in that it affects uh, predominantly the most vulnerable in society. So we work with a cross range of stakeholders, police, ambulance services, community groups, safety hubs, to make sure that we are within there and where possible, we will have an intervention from a fire perspective. Of course, we can only intervene where it is fire, but we want to support and grow our work within those communities. So our RRM was a reflection of that. So the, the RRM is the risk and resourcing model. And this is the change because the fire services are risk-based organizations. They are not demand-led. So we need to look where the risk is within the county and we need to look where the risk lies with uh, groups or demographics of people. And we provide and tailor our response, which is the prevention work we do, and the response to those, those groups or that, that area of the, the county in a specific way. Now, when we undertook the risk and resource model consultation, we said there was a over provision of appliances, i.e. response elements within the York area. And we had an under provision of prevention and protection work. So we've moved resources from one side of the organization to the other based on the risk within the county. Now, the risk and resource models are undertaken usually between three to five years. And that's because society changes. And we need to make sure our business model, our delivery model to the public, 
not only aligns with them and the risk within the county, but that we're able to, where possible, project our resources so that we are ahead of those risks and we can always make sure we are providing the right intervention at the right time with the right skills of our staff and the right equipment. And I suppose fundamentally it's, it's spending the budget that you've got yes. in the right way. It is. As any business would, you have to transition your resources around. And then you had a, I think that was back end of last year, was it? Or, or no, January this year, wasn't it? It was fact? when the report was released, yeah, yes. January this year. Yes. And then in April, you had a follow-up letter we did. that said that they're sort of seeing that you've got um, plans in place to, yes. to tackle the points that they'd, they'd made. Yes. Where, where do you see that going now? What's the next sort of step with the HMIC side okay. of things? From my perspective, I th I'm confident that it will be a, a further positive outcome. So we had the full inspection, and after that they released our first full report. Sorry, the second full report, because the, there was one pre-COVID. Now, the inspector had changed between those two periods, and they'd matured their processes within there. Now, we were found inadequate in two key areas, and requires improvement in the third area. As a result of that, they issued us what's called two causes of concern. Now, they are points that they say will affect public safety. So we immediately put the plans in place and we had been working on these before the HMI had come in, but they recognized it and I agreed with their findings. We had the plans in place, we transitioned the resources to where we needed to, and we had the right staff then making the improvements required. And that was recognized in their first cause of concern inspection. They've just undertaken so you had an, an update letter in April, I think, this this year that yes. um, that was quite complimentary, saying that they they could see that you were you got plans in place to tackle the cause for concerns. Yes, um, but they needed more time to see them actually working. And they were they were right to say that. So they did an inspection in January, and then they released the findings out, out in April as against that. Now we were given two causes of concern. Now, a cause of concern from the uh, inspector's perspective is something that could impact public safety. So we already had the plans in place. We were already making those improvements that was required. And we've made those in a very short period of time. And we've had a second re-inspection in September. The findings will be formally released by the uh, inspector in October of this year. But I'm positive from the initial feedback that we've had that they continue to support us. They continue to support the strategic direction that I'm taking the organization and the improvements. And the improvements are both on a public perspective and also internally for our own staff. Of course, we have to await the final uh, report from the inspectorate, but I am confident that it will be a positive outcome. And when, when you mentioned there the sort of strategic direction of the organization. Yes. It, is it possible to define that in just you know, an interview like this, or is, it, is that much bigger, no, well, bigger piece of work? No, no, because our strategic direction is effectively the organization's purpose. The commissioner under her family rescue plan, she has a vision that, to make people safe and feel safe in York and North Yorkshire. My perspective and our purpose in this organization is to make sure that we are a community-centered organization with people at the center of what we do, and that is delivering risk and vulnerability reduction. And our crews come to work under that one mission and that's what all our plans and policies and, and the strategies are aligned to. Because our core focus from a legislative perspective and also a moral one is to make people be safe and feel safe. And that's what we're here for.